Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Baller Show. If you're new here, my name is V Lee, and this is the show about real estate investing. All right, so today's topic is eight ways to finance your investment properties. So V, as you know, the real estate investing space is as cash intensive as it gets. Yep. And so one of the key battles is how do you keep managing your money? So you've always got money in the bank as you continue to operate. And so what we're here to do today is to walk through a variety of ways that people can fund their acquisitions and stay in a healthy space in terms of having cash sitting in their bank account. That's right. Because, you know, it's often people forget that beside the money to acquire the property, you still have that ongoing constant cash draining that's uh, taking cash out of your account, doesn't it? Right. You've got your renovations and your holding costs, debt service, the dog ate your homework, and you got to go and find some more paperwork. Everything's going on all the time. You need cash in hand. Yep. So unlike what Grant Cardone said, cash is trash. I do think in our situations, when you're looking at buying investment property, sometimes cash is king. No doubt. All right. So let's talk about what the different ways that an investor, so like V. Lee, I have a contract to purchase a property now, and I'm thinking I may fix it. I may sell it. I may flip it. I mean, I may keep it right different exit strategy that i'm gonna use let's start with how am i going to buy this property on this closing date now that i have a contract easiest way is cash most obvious right cash so if somebody is like bill gates and they've got all the cash on hand there's no reason to be worrying about all these other things that we're going to talk about they can just use the cash but what happens a lot of times is someone has enough cash to buy one house and then they're afraid to go under contract with other houses because they don't want to incur any debt service. And they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So easiest way is to use your own cash and pay for the purchase with the cash because you don't have any underwriting. You don't have to wait for any one approval. It's your own approval. As long as you're happy with the purchase, you can pay with your own cash. Right. And you're not incurring the debt service. Yeah, And if you're in the business long enough, you'll always have a seller who's expecting you to bring a briefcase full of $20 bills. So right. once you get that, then you know you've been in the business long enough. Now, in some instances where your purchase price is so low that you find very few lender that might finance that property, in that instance, you may have to come up with the cash to purchase. So the key thing here, if you buy with cash, just like Adam said, you got to make sure you have enough money for the acquisition costs, meaning the purchase of the property. And then you got to have enough money for rehab and holding costs. Right, Adam? Exactly right. Okay. So for holding costs, meaning like the yard maintenance, the utility. Insurance. Insurance. Taxes if it's escrow, that kind of thing. Okay. So that's, we got that. So cash, right? Easiest way. Uh, the next way that you can finance your investment property is through private lenders. So who are private lenders, Adam? Yeah. So people use these terms differently. We think of a private lender when we're talking about it. This is a friend or family member, somebody you met at Thanksgiving dinner and you were talking about what's going on. You're having a few drinks and they said they could lend you the money to help you in your next endeavor. They'll likely be the least expensive. They'll be the most flexible, but they'll be the least reliable. They may have even forgotten about the conversation by the time it actually is ready to happen. Especially if you had it over martini. Right, exactly. <laughs> so this is like your rich uncle, right? Correct. Most of, And most of the time they're afraid of it because they don't understand it. So you do need to spend a lot of time explaining to them how the process works, how they're protected with lean positions and all this other stuff. And once they've done one or two transactions, then they'll be excited about it. But at the very beginning, you'll want to talk to them way before you actually need the money so that they don't feel rushed. I think that's absolutely right. You got to build up, you got to warm up that relationship before you ask someone for, you know, $100,000 or $200,000 that may be tied up for a few months. Correct. So also easy if you get a relationship going, but it Correct. takes a lot of time and effort to build that trust, that relationship up front. 
obviously you don't have the underwriting process either. All it is is if that person likes you enough and trusts you enough to send you that money. But I, I would recommend that you let them understand that there'll be a deed of trust and they'll have a first lien position just so that they can put their head on the pillow at night. Know that you're not just doing this thing with a crayon on a napkin. Absolutely. So, you know, if you use private lender, you need to protect your lenders because in case if something happened to you, you know, you also got to make sure that they are protected too because that's also their hard earned money that you, you don't want to mess with. Right. So, well, they could also fund 100% of your project, meaning your purchase, your rehab costs, and also they may roll in your holding costs with it and collect everything when you exit the property. That's correct. Okay, so next, let's talk about sometimes also labeled as private lender, but these are more professional private lenders and they are often called hard money lenders. Right. So when you hear the hard money lender term, that's somebody where it's a lender who's using the hard asset as the collateral versus your credit worthiness. And some of them will be big institutional hard money lenders. And some of them will be people who you'll meet at your local real estate investor association who are professional. They're very comfortable doing it all the time, but it might be a one or two man operation. These people will be more formal. The hard money institutional lenders, they'll usually require an appraisal. The private professional one from the RIA, the Real Estate Investor Association, mm -hmm. they usually won't require an appraisal. They'll have some kind of a process, but they'll be very similar in terms of what they're charging you with the institutional hard money lenders, and they'll be more than your family member private lender would charge. So typically with a hard money lender, they'll charge you an origination fee um, and then the ongoing interest rate. And it's typically an interest only loan for a short period of time. And they usually have somebody like uh, Tony Soprano in the background to, That's to right. I, break I, your knuckles I, you know, if you don't pay one time. So car money lenders, AKA loan shark, what I used to call them <laughs> until I get to know the business better. And then I change my opinion because they are necessary for investors. And the, the thing with hard money lenders is they're repeat business players. And so they're getting business from the same people over and over. So they certainly have to be doing something where people want to do business with them. So the good thing about harmony lenders though, is also they in the business to make money. So they're not going to make a bad loan, right? If you go to a harmony lenders and you present your numbers and they say, oh, no way. Then you need to go and check your numbers because obviously they don't want to lose money. And if you decide to get into that deal, you may have a chance of losing money. Right. That's exactly yeah. right. Also with the hard money lender, that's enabling people to grow their business faster yeah. than they could if that uh, option wasn't available. Because the key is to keep acquiring whenever you have an opportunity. So the hard money lender, they do have uh, like an underwriting process where it's not emotional like your private lender. If you meet their underwriting requirements, they most likely will do the loan. And they also reliable. And um, the, the hard money lender will be lending at a lower loan to value number than a conventional bank would. And that's happening because they're not spending the time to underwrite the credit worthiness and they're underwriting much riskier properties because these are all properties that need a lot of renovations. I, I think some example would be like RCN, Red's Cap. Regional ones like Jet in Texas. You've got uh, Kiavi, which was called something else before. There's now KIA. Lending home. Yeah. Used to be Lending Home. Lending now it's called home. Kiavi. So all of the national lenders, what they all, I feel like what they all have in common is their under, uh, underwriting guidelines very similar. And they usually require you to put 10% down. Yeah. There's also uh, American Heritage Lending okay. in uh, California. So there, a lot of these are in different parts of the country, interestingly. Yeah. So in my experience, I find that the local hard money lenders tend to be easier to work with than the national hard money lenders. But if you are in a market where you don't even have a local hard money lender, then you have limited options. Yeah. And there's uh, there's lending associations and you can always reach out to them and find out who they recommend or who they know in your market. So there's the American Association of Private Lenders. There's the National Private Lending Association. These guys all have conferences. You can go there and, and find out who's operating. Well, and that's good to know. So with hard money lender, I don't think you require to have excellent credit either. You, you just need to have so-so credit and you do need to have some reserve. Right. Okay. So 
that get us to the next way to finance your prop your investment properties and this is through a line of credit yes this episode is brought to you by buzz vacation rentals a premier property management company in houston and galveston give buzz a call today if you need help in managing your short-term and vacation rental properties at 281-549-8432 or visit their website at buzzvacationsrentals.com. Now back to the Real Estate Baller Show. For a line of credit, you can either get a secured line of credit or an unsecured line of credit. The idea is that you're looking to get credit oftentimes based on the collateral you have. That'd be a secured line of credit so that you'd have funds available only when you need them and you're not paying interest when you don't need it. You can get an unsecured line of credit just go out, reach out to your bank, but you always want to find out about what availability you have for your line of credit before you need it. You don't want to call them the day before you need it and then ask them what's going on. But once you've got the line of credit, then that will allow you to expand your business because you know you have funds that you can pull from at any time. Very powerful. It is very powerful. The part that is challenging about this is not everyone can get a line of credit because they obviously want you to have good credit and then you got to have some money with the bank, some deposit. They call it depositorial relationship, right? Did I say that correctly? I think you did, V. Oh, well, how about <laughs> that, huh? Mm -hmm. So uh, that is very important with the bank that you want to get line of credit through. The big banks I know can give you a $25,000 unsecure line of credit. Pretty easy if you have a banker that you have a relationship with. If you want more than that, they're going to require some paperwork. And line of credit is flexible. You pay interest only for the money that you use. You don't use it, you don't pay. Right. And I just, uh, I had refinanced a bunch of properties with the bank just over a year ago. And so just last week, I had it on a pop-up that after it had been a year of the relationship, I wanted to go back to the guy, the banker, and talk about the line of credit. Mm -hmm. And so I really had it on a pop-up on the calendar, yeah. sent him an email last week, and now we have it on the schedule to have a conversation next week to review what I would be allowed to have as a line of credit now that I've had a year of doing business with them. Yeah, this is really powerful if you plan ahead, like if you plan your relationship ahead of time, so you can have account at Wells Fargo, account at Chase, account at Capital One, Citibank, and then you go to each of these banks and you ask for a $25,000 line of credit, unsecure. If you got five lines, that's $100,000. Mm -hmm. Free mm -hmm. money. I mean, not free money, but it's like a checkbook. Like you write it as you need it. It's very powerful if you really take time and work this way. The other way we want to touch on is the secure line of credit where the bank will pre-approve a set amount for you. So you can use that to purchase property and it's secure by the property via deed of trust. Yep. You hit it. You hit it 100%. Nothing else to add there. Pass, 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 huh? <laughs> well, bang. You're on fire today, V. I, I, I feel like it, Adam. I feel like I'm on a roll today. <laughs> so the things to know, what are the things that they need to know about the this, uh, secure line of credit? Well, they need to talk to the banker. The banker will talk to them about what their exposure is on it. And uh, sometimes it's something where it's going to be good for a year. And then in a year, they're going to want to go ahead and review what it is. So it may not be something where once you've gotten the approval one time, it's good to go because the valuation of your portfolio may have changed. The winds may have changed direction. Any number of things can happen. So you do want to be in communication. So with this way, though, the bank is going to want everything, right? They're going to want your tax returns. They're going to want your profit and loss statement, your balance sheet. I even had a bank ask me to write a one page like bio of why they should lo give me this line of credit. Um, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, because it was a new relationship. So obviously they didn't know who I was. So they would feel more comfortable if I, you know, write a one page about myself and how I, I'm a good uh, borrower. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And did you get that line or did they uh, not buy into your story? You did. I did get the line. Okay, um, good. So the good news is when you can get these line of credit, it's lower interest rate because it's usually uh, the prime plus a number. And the better, better relationship that you have with the bank, the lower that number is. It could be 
prime plus half, uh, prime plus a quarter, prime plus one, plus one and a half. It's very based on your relationship with the bank. And then I think they also charge you like your origination up front. So, so when you met with the, or you reached out to this bank who was a new bank relationship, mm -hmm. did you do it by phone or email or in person? Um, well, so I don't go blindly into any bank to do this, right? I would ask around for referral. Hey, who, which bank do you do business with? Who do you know? And you need to talk to a business banker. Don't waste your time with your personal banker at the bank. And you cannot do this with the big banks either. You got to do it with your smaller bank, the local banks, because the Chase, the Bank of America, they don't understand our business and they right. probably won't agree to do this. That's okay? exactly right. Yeah. Good point. So, but the cumbersome part about this way, the money is cheap, but you got to fulfill your requirements, your financial requirements, meaning you got to submit your, your financial to them quarterly or annually, however frequency, the frequency they need you to submit, but it's worth it. Oh, you know what? Uh, if you have money at an account like a Fidelity or Morgan Stanley or any of that stuff, you can leverage that money and get a line off of that, that money there. So that's what I do. So I've got my money with Morgan Stanley and I've got an access line off of that, which is a percentage of the amount of money I have with them. So that is another form of secure line of credit, right? Correct. It's the line of credit secure by your own cash. Correct. Yes. You can secure it by a CD, by a money market account, or your portfolio, in your case with Fidelity. So they got that one going on. I've done that before where um, this bank was having a special. So where you, if you put $100,000 into a CD for a period of time, they would give you twice that in a line of credit. Really? So that was really good. But then wow. they, they, they shut down that, <laughs> that oh. special. So I was really disappointed. Were they calling that the V Lee special and then they had to shut it down or because you kept taking advantage of it or how did that work? You know, that banker uh, was not at the bank anymore. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> but something like that, you gotta, you, you just have to keep looking around because you never know what banks might need business and they might be willing to do a lot of things when they need business. That's true. Okay. So next we have is community banks. I love community banks. So do what, I. What you'll find with community banks is that they'll usually be so much easier to deal with than the big box banks. And for your properties that are in areas that are small towns and such, mm -hmm. if there's a community bank that's in that area, that might be your very best chance to get a long-term loan. They'll be a little bit more flexible than your big banks there. And th those are the ones that we work with all the time. So with community banks, again, I think it's really important to have the right banker on your side. That banker is, is going to make it or break it for you. So you have a, the banker, they typically, their underwriting process is typically what a, a board meeting that they have maybe on a Tuesday morning and the banker will show up with all your stuff and, and convince the board that, Hey, look, this person is a good borrower. I have all their numbers here, all their chart. Look how much money they make. And then they vote and then they say, yeah, let's do the loan. Right. That's, that's exactly right. The benefit of community bank, just like you said, like Adam said, is lower interest rate. They flexible. You get an answer quickly. Now you just got to know when the board meets though. Like if you pass that meeting time, then you got to wait until the next meeting for them to, <laughs> to meet again so they that's can funny. approve. <laughs> yeah. So don't wait until the last minute. This is something you want to do ahead of time, way ahead of time before you need the money. The disadvantage is they need paperwork as well, just like the other line of credit and they need you, you to put more money down. Well, that's a big disadvantage is they're going to ask you for 20% down as an example. Yeah. And you're not going to have that same ask from the private lender right. or the hard money lender or these other sources we've been talking about. Right. So, yeah, so that can be substantial, especially for people who just starting out with very, you know, with little cash. Cause if you buy five and you get a 20 to 25% down on five, all five of them that take up a lot of your cash. And there's a big time issue too, isn't there? 
with getting it spun from when you put in the loan application for a bank to when it actually happens that you don't have these other options. You know, I found it to be hit or miss, right? If you have a good relationship again with a bank, then that process can be quick. But it won't be like at the speed of a hard money lender or the other way. It does. It's going to take about. 30 days at least to 45 days or more from the, the application to closing. So make sure you plan your time appropriately. Um, the other downside of this is also it's a, uh, a balloon note. If you enjoyed this episode so far, do hit that like and subscribe button now so that we can keep giving you tips on real estate investing. So they typically would do a five years balloon and amortize over 15 or 20 years. I think for new constructions, they'll go up to 25 years, if I'm not mistaken. So, well, they all have they all have the different rules yeah. and overlays on it. Yeah. So you're right. You want to ask them what what their fine print is with early buyouts and all that kind of stuff. Right. And all of these do require a personal guarantee. So just remember that too. You know, I I don't have a problem with doing a personal guarantee because I think I always. I mean, I don't think I do want to pay my debt. So for some people, it seems to be a big deal of putting their personal guarantee on a note. And there's one other point, I think, because the Burr method has become so popular in the last five or six years, people will, will use the hard money lender for the bridge loan, and then they will go ahead and refinance out with the bank. What is the Burr method, Adam? The Burr method B is where you're going to buy the house. That's the first, that's the B. Then the different R's are you're going to uh, rehab, rent, refinance, and then rinse and repeat. And so people will use, they'll buy it with the hard money loan or the private lender's money. Mm -hmm. They'll fix it up. They'll put the renter in place and then they're going to turn it into a long-term loan. So they'll do a refinance and they'll go to the bank. Yeah. But if they don't know how the seasoning works for the bank, mm -hmm. which is usually at least six months, mm -hmm. then what will happen is the bank will do the loan only based on a loan to cost basis, not a loan to value. If it has seasoned and so they've gone past the seasoning period, then they'll go ahead and get an appraisal of the new value, and then you might get some money back. Okay. I think one of the thing about that method too is if you pay with cash, right? Especially if you pay cash, the, the bank has a, you call it a seasoning period. So they may not give you as much money as what you got in it. Yeah, and they'll have a delayed finance option if you if you bought it with cash versus took out a loan. So it's funny, you're right. If you took out a loan, they feel better about it when they yeah. refinance it than if you paid with your own money. Very odd. Now, if you want to create a note, you could. I guess you could. <laughs> and so that way, at least you know that that's what you're going to get back, your payoff amount. Good point. So community banks, um, it's a great way if you're thinking of buy and hold. Now, uh, because they amortize only over 15 or 20 years, so that will bring up your monthly debt amount. So just keep that in mind also when you go through the community banks. Um, you know, your notes will get paid down faster, but obviously you may or may not cash flow because your monthly payment is now higher. Great point. Okay, so there's five ways already, right? Okay, so one more, another way. This is probably, I say, one of the most complicated way. And many people do advertise it as low risk, easy to do. But I would say I would disagree. So it's called sub two. What is sub two, Adam? So sub two means that you're buying a property subject to the existing mortgage. So if V is the seller, and I'm the buyer, and she has a mortgage with uh, the property, I'm going to essentially take over V's mortgage payments. It helps V out so she can go on with her life. And then what almost always would happen would be that my plan would be either to assign or wholesale to someone. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a renter in place there. And the idea would be that there is a delta between what the mortgage payment is and what the rent payment is for the end buyer. And everything works out perfectly until it doesn't. So as soon as somebody doesn't pay the bank like they're supposed to, that's when problems can happen. And so if the tenant stops paying, then sometimes the 
middle person or the person who's taking over subject to forget somehow to pay the bank and then V gets in trouble. Theoretically, the bank could call the note due. Yeah, We don't see it very often, but that's a possibility. Uh, so there's a lot of paperwork that goes in that gets involved with who's actually paying the bank and how does the other person get notified that a payment was made to the bank and a lot of what happens if scenarios. So it's very delicate. It's not something that uh, I would recommend to anybody who's new to this uh, investor space. Oh, yeah. When you do, I would advise against it because it's very complicated. And if it's not done correctly, it will bite you in the rear. So only do this if you know what you're doing. So I'm in North Carolina and we're, we are a state where the attorneys are the ones who do the closings. Yeah. And there's very few attorneys who even want to deal with it and they know what's going on. So yeah. there's a few attorneys who will sort of specialize in it, but everybody else will run for the hills. Well, when we sign a contract to do a sub two, I mean, it's like a thick stack of paperwork that the seller have to sign. This is good because obviously the investor does not need to have credit, right? Or approval process. Typically, it would be back to your example earlier, V, the seller, selling Adam a house. So Adam may need very little money up front if the house is in fairly good condition. The only thing that Adam may need to bring in is obviously the closing costs and some money to entice V to sell it. Correct. Okay. In all my time, the seller, often you don't hear from them again as long as the notes continue to be paid. If you decide to do a sub two, you got to be upfront, very upfront with the seller. I'm not paying off your mortgage. I'm going to take over your payment. And they are placing a huge amount of trust on you, hoping that you will continue to make the payment. Right. Because there are investors who would do what? Do a sub two on one end, either lease it or owner finance it on the other end, collect that money and never pay the original note. That's bad. Some people get a third party servicing company involved. So the money flows through and everyone gets notified and all that kind of thing. But yeah. A lot of risks. Yeah. But, but that's just bad business altogether. If you promise someone to do something and you don't, right? Yes. So sub two, you can buy the property subject to the existing note, probably little money out of pocket. You save on the closing costs. Sometime when the deal is so tight, it allows you another way of making money buying through a sub two. So you can either sell it, hold it, or own or finance it. Whichever yes. way you decide to do, just make sure your paperwork is well documented. The biggest thing is also make sure the mortgage company that you have authorization to speak to the mortgage company on the seller's behalf. If they don't want to speak to you, if something happened to the property, and this that insurance check come in or the escrow money when you sell whatever not will go back to the original seller so make sure that you uh, protect yep. it so great key, point key point here whatever it is that you do make sure you dot your i and cross your t and sub two great points yeah we had a time where i you know i just let things get passed by we're busy we running right yes we forgot about the insurance oh no so the insurance company like your your homeowner insurance you need to make sure your name is on it too and then you need to make sure you have that power of, of attorney from the seller to give you the right because let's say you, you do an insurance claim the check is going to come to you to the seller and to their bank so mm -hmm. how are you going to get it cash right so that's probably a second part to this right <laughs> sounds like you've had a lot of chapters in the book of sub twos I've done a few and I made a few mistakes. And so, you know, you learn as you go. I guess so. Even though I had a really good teacher, but you know, sometimes you, you can't learn everything. Right. So, okay. Okay. Next one is seller finance and lease option. Right. So seller finance and lease option, or you might hear a term just rent to own as well. So in the seller finance scenario, the seller is essentially acting as the bank. And why would a seller want to do that? Why would they be willing to delay getting paid? Well, it might be a property that's difficult to sell and you were willing to deal with the property, or it might be that you are willing to pay much more 
as a person taking over the seller financing than a cash buyer would have, and that was worth it for them. So that's why they would do it on the seller's end, but most of them won't. So you have to work hard to get that done. But if you can get it done, it's such a great benefit for you as the buyer because it's such a low amount of cash out of pocket. So this is also an advanced technique too, right? It's not something that you go out and get your first deal done and you're going to do an owner financing deal. Unless you come from a finance background and you're really good at, at numbers and structuring deals and notes and whatnot. So basically, it helps the buyer and investor to have very little skin in the game or little money out of pocket. And you don't even have to have credit or anything because most of the seller that would agree to this, they're not quite as savvy. But in, in this scenario, though, we're talking about the same, like V, the seller. I'm selling you, Adam, a property. But right. instead of you paying me cash, let's right. say you offer 100000 and I said, no, I don't, I, I don't want to take that. I want 130 Then right? I'd say, uh, if you, how about I do 130 Would you be willing to pay it, up, pay it, get it paid it for 10 years? That's exactly. So what you just did is you asked me to fi owner finance it to you. For was it thirty thousand, an extra thirty thousand over ten years, right? Right, and then we would agree on the deposit and the interest payments. The interest payments is part of the monthly payments. So I guess ten years there'll be one hundred twenty payments, one hundred thirty thousand divided by one hundred twenty payments, and I'll be making payment. Adam will be making payment to me. Right, and the other benefit for the owner financing versus the lease option stuff is that the if it's sold to me, now all the taxes go to me and all the risk of the properties go to me. Right. If it's if it's something where I'm leasing it with an option to buy it, then the way that would work would be V and I would agree that for a period of time, I'm going to rent it from her. And at some trigger point, buy a trigger point, I've got to then decide if I want to buy it. So that might be a year or two years down the road. But during that year or two years down the road or whatever time frame, V is still the owner, and so she's still responsible for taxes, maintenance, repairs, everything. Well, as an investor, I think the owner financing is a great way to go because you don't have to, again, go out and seek capital. Yes. Another advantage of this is, let's say, a year into it or two years into it, you can also go back to the seller and say, hey, I can pay you off now, but it's going to be 90000 instead of 130. You're saying you can renegotiate it as time That's passes. That's right. Right. So it does give the investor a lot of flexibility, but you got to know what you're doing to make that offer and to structure that deal. And we don't have enough time to really go into depth about how it should be structured, but do consult with people who know what they're doing. Okay. So last way is using money in your self-directed retirement account such as the IRA or 401k. Now this way is not available to everybody because obviously you got to have one of these accounts first. Right. So Adam, have you ever done this? Yeah, I've got a solo 401k set up okay. and, and there's specific kinds of properties that meet the criteria for it and I use it for those. So it's a, it's a long list of the restrictions and rules for these, but I've I probably use about once every three or four months. So people, this is ideal for people who used to have a corporate job or work at a company and left and go to a different company. During that, when you leave a company, you're allowed to roll your money into another account. And that is your a self direct. You can roll it into a self directed 401k IRA, you know, talk to a custodian about it and they will guide you through that process. But what self-directed means is that now I can direct my account to invest in the allow asset. The key thing is what? To not do a U commit a UBIT transactions that will result in a penalty or a taxing event. Because the right. whole point is so that you have free access to your money, right? And earn money for your retirement account. Right. Very restrictive. There's a lot of things to encourage uh, or require arm's length transactions yeah. to be there. There's a book that I love called Going Solo yeah. that talks all about this stuff. Uh, there's 
plenty of companies out there that are well known, like I guess Americans, one of the ones. Uh, Quest does this stuff. Well, Quest They're... is really good. They're really good in terms of educating people. They put a lot of webinars and events around the country to educate people on investing in real estate and using their uh, retirement accounts or the HSA accounts. I've done buy property with my IRA money and then own and finance it. I think Adam, you've done the same. Yes. And that's a good way to let the money sit in your retirement account and you don't have to pay tax on it, but just talk to your custodian, make sure you don't do anything that would create an audit, a problem where you got to pay tax on the capital gain in that account. Yep, it's a, it's a great way to avoid taxes without getting thrown in jail. That's right. Now, I did learn this though, that you cannot buy a vacation rental or a short-term rental in your self-directed retirement account. You know why? Why? Because you would go on vacation? Well, if, you can, if you're going to come and stay there, you cannot... Then it's for your own use. Yes. Yes. So it's a prohibited transaction. Got it. Yeah, so you cannot buy it in that account. Okay. Uh, and everything, the, the cumbersome part about this is that everything that you do, if you buy a house with your self-directed account, then you got to pay all the bills out of that account. You cannot yes. pay out of your own account. And then Correct. you cannot be directly benefited from it. Right. So if you're a real estate agent and you list that house for sale, you cannot earn a real estate commission. That's right. So... Just those are the things to watch for, but that's a great way to get access to your own money. That's a good one. Okay, well, that is all. Let us know how you finance your property. If we missed one, let us know that too. Yeah, if we do miss one, I, I think we cover almost everything. But you know, you never know because people are really creative, right? Thank you for watching the Real Estate Ballers Show. If you find value in this show, hit that like and subscribe button now. Also, leave us a comment below. Let us know how you are financing for your investment property. Thank you and see you next time.